in, in cities that grow very rapidly, there is a kind of quick and dirty solution that is not integrated at all. No public transport, no public space, no schools, no jobs. Two years ago, Human Habitat set up an urban planning and design lab in order to work on actual projects in different cities. We create, as UN Habitat, we create the situation, the fertile ground for a team to come in, to bring in design. And then that design can be elaborated along the process. And the urban labs work in, in 40 cities and every city is specific, but the challenges are quite similar, huh? quite similar challenges. So we need showcases in these, in these contexts, in these contexts where sometimes legal and financial frameworks are not yet in place. And therefore you need to bring good people together in a collaboration. You set up a team of experts with international experience that exchange ideas and that follow the principles that we've set out as UN Habitat. So let's say that approach you can replicate, bringing international expertise together, bring in the design early in the process and then start to kind of to, to, to refine the design and to find entry points to start, because that is the most important. We don't want to make paper tigers. We want to do real things. In August 2016, a group of architects and planners from the Netherlands returned to Gaza for the second time to work together with a team of local planners. My experience in working in conflict areas is that mayors and local authorities have to run their cities and their villages on a day-to-day -day basis. So a war or no war, people ask them, where is the school going to, to be and where are our houses? Or he's confronted with a lot of people immigrating or flowing into his area and he has to accommodate them. The project involved the redesign of a number of areas in Gaza that were destroyed during the conflict of 2014 with Israel. Gaza is faced with a number of critical challenges, including water shortages, good sewage systems, and dwindling farmland. Projected population increase is also bearing down on this tiny strip of land, just 50 kilometers long, and only six kilometers wide in most places. For a lot of people, probably Gaza is not on their bucket list. For me, it was a point of discussion. Here you're really confronted by an urbanism that is really facing humanitarian problems. Actually, it's more about the fundamentals of landscape architecture, having good infrastructure, having a good sewage system, taking care of your water management. We're very, very close to the border, so this is where everybody expects the next uh, attack to happen. So the question is, do you do then agriculture because houses would be destroyed or do you actually build houses close to the border because Israel wouldn't destroy houses, they would destroy orchards? I don't know, I, I find that a perverse logic, so I, I try not to go along with that. al Shoka is located close to the Egyptian border and includes the ruins of the Yasser Arafat International Airport. These landmarks of Palestinian identity are potential economic drivers. Sitting areas, they can put some toys for the children here. Yeah, we yeah. have street here. We have seated on. We have a green area in the middle. And, and a lot of people go there. Lot of people everyone? Go there. Yeah, everyone. Girls, boys, yeah. uh, old people. Yeah. We have to learn where they, their needs are, where the dynamics are, uh, so that we can, for example, make better use of what is already here, the schools. How can we add uh, new uh, users for the school? For example, now it's summer, there's no one here. Uh, but it's a, a building, a large playground. Why is there any activity? Contributing to resilient development and good cities means it's essential for the team to consult with the people who live and work in a place. It's impossible to create a sustainable plan if you don't know anything about people's lives or their desires. Mm -hmm. 
لا شغل ولا وظيفه ولا حاجه حتى امهات امهات بيزعلوا طب تحبوا تشوفوا مثلا في موجوده بالاماكن هيك بالعكس هيك بدنا منتزهات يعني ملاعب كوع حاجات للاولاد للشباب احنا كان يا ريت اف يو وونت تو بيلد بابليك سبيسز اند يو كم اب از ا انترناشونال ديزاينر اور ايفن ا لوكال ديزاينر بس يو دونت نو وات ذا بيبل وونت اور وات they normally do in life, then it's uh, quite difficult. So in the planning process, there's a, a participatory component. And I think if you involve people in the planning, they will also show more ownership, especially because we are working in existing environments. So we have to deal with those realities and maybe we can approve it, but we have to know how it works. فانت فوق ما انت مدمر من فوق ما انت مدمر تروح تجيب من شركات خاصه تجي تيجي تتخلص لك من الحاجات هذه ما كانتش موجوده في الاخر بدك تحطها في مطرح ما فيش مطرح للبلديه اللي يكون تحط فيه النفايات انت خليك وين تعمل موقع؟ I think we need to sort our thoughts a little bit so we need to somehow see what is a possible strategy to Well, to do something meaningful in this context. Huh? That's what we're going to do now. Put some extra ideas on the table and broaden the discussion. Site visits and discussions with the local population enable the team to develop a plan that local designers and UN Habitat in Palestine can work with. It's extremely important to transfer all the ideas into a framework that can be used by the people on the ground. An accessible framework that people can actually work with. Taking the 17,000 into, into consideration, you need for the next 20 years, you need 33% of the current surface. Back in the days in the Netherlands, uh, we used to canalize larger rivers into small canals. And this caused all kinds of problems. These natural systems like a wadi, they need their space. There are other elements. For example, if we change zoning, then we increase profit from our landowners. Half of the profit goes to the owner, half of the profit goes to the, the, to, to the government. It will be helpful for us. They just give new ideas. So we are going to change some of the, uh, the master plans which we have done. Some people may think that the, the international team came here for Gaza because Gaza is a special case, but I think this kind of cooperation is needed everywhere in the world. Really, it was very, very interesting uh, experience uh, for me personally and for other, for my colleagues and even for, for the, uh, our distinguished guests from the international team. Thinking on the urbanization happening in Gaza, it requires the attention of, of many stakeholders here because it is such an exceptional case. So I think it is important to think about preserving and improving quality. Quality for people that is free. I'm not talking about shopping malls, I'm, not, I'm talking about real quality that is free for people to meet and to interact and to enjoy what is there to enjoy in life. That requires precision and also dedication. And I have, I have the feeling we can win a lot by doing this project with the Urban Labs. In 2014, Typhoon Yolanda hit the Philippines. It came on land in the city of Tacloban. The Urban Labs team here is in fact working in a post-disaster situation. The big challenge is to shift the initiatives on the ground from a state of emergency to one of development. You cannot avoid the typhoons, but you can make sure that cities develop in a safe and resilient way. Immediately after the storm, we realized that it was important to partner with experts, experts in rehabilitation, reconstruction, urban planning, uh, which are all the key elements really in rebuilding and restructuring you know, a, uh, a uh, community. After the storm, a lot of people have very quickly rebuilt their homes. And yes, they're rebuilding them in a sort of compact, informal way. You see it along the coast here. 
tens of thousands of people were left uh, homeless. When uh, a great surge of uh, charity um, institutions came in to help, which was a very good thing, they found out that there was um, a lack of a good uh, master plan for the whole city. So that resulted in a lot of uh, settlements, resettlement areas, that were uh, put in the landscape without any planning. And that's the reason why we're here. We're here to um, help and advise in making an urban master plan. The Tacloban team operated differently uh, than the other uh, urban labs. The other urban labs were pretty much focused around uh, concentrated missions. In, in Tacloban, the various partners of the team, they went and they, and they came back. And, and this all had to do with the, with the pressure on the, on the project. We have seen that the north of Tacloban City, we call it Tacloban North, is the most safe resettlement that can be done. So uh, we planned this uh, permanent sites and we moved a thousand families in the past two years in transitional houses. We are talking about moving 14,500 people to safer places. The impact is very huge, of course. The assistance at this very critical stage for us to plan a better, safer, more resilient city, it's very critical at this stage. The, the, the impact of the uh, design team, the experts that are here, are uh, definitely much faster. It's more effective. And uh, having this realization that it is a growing and a uh, and uh, a living document that you know it always has to be revisited and uh, and most importantly it has to be customized the larger region the other islands in, in the neighborhood are faced with constant threats of typhoons of earthquakes of mudslides etc actually several a year so the chances that a major disaster strikes the region is almost 100% every year, which means that this city will likely absorb refugees from other areas. So it has to become a transient city. It has to become a city that is able to swell up and accommodate these refugees easily. My vision here is that uh, we will be the template of the country. Uh, in terms of uh, disaster preparedness. And obviously, you know, uh, it's not only preparing for another uh, very strong typhoon, but also preparing for any kind of uh, weather disturbance, challenge, and uh, be it uh, natural and be it man-made. Some essential things are still lacking. So we are now in the process uh, discussing with the government and discussing with the specialists before the plan gets finally or finalized, uh, that we still make sure that these essential components are part of this very important legal framework for the development of Takraman in the future. The Venice Architecture Biennale 2016 was a great opportunity to do two things to tell everybody in the architecture and planning world that the urban labs are going on, and to organize meetings for the design teams involved to update each other on their projects and to share experiences. All of the teams, most of them complete, were in Venice, as were their counterparts, the local architects and decision makers from the participating cities. Unfortunately, the local team from Gaza was not permitted to leave Palestine. The design process continued seamlessly as the teams met with each other and their local counterparts at various events. The designers, as always armed with markers and paper, started sketching immediately and fact-checking with their counterparts to verify assumptions, hungry for even more information and the exchange of ideas. The ambition of, of the presentation is different, so we're actually gathering information and, and creating political uh, support for the project, whereas here we're trying to get reflection and feedback from professional counterparts. 
We're now in Ca Foscari, it's the University of Venice, and we are in this beautiful auditorium. The people are coming in right now, but we have uh, the representative of each of the countries, so we are also able to have a discussion among uh, the different uh, countries involved, um, how they see the urban lab, what their experience is, and what they can learn from each other. Of course, it was very important that Juan Clos, executive director of UN Habitat, was present, and that he joined in on the discussions. His attendance was a clear sign of his support of the Urban Labs program. If the population of humanity is going to reach 10 billion people, uh, there's no other uh, pragmatic solution than being urbanized because we cannot live a scattered with such a big numbers in the planet. Eh? The Urban Labs program was invited to Mexico City to work on a specific project in the neighborhood of Doctores, located right between the historic center and a dynamic area surrounding it. Doctores has a bad reputation. There's a lot of crime and it's extremely difficult to initiate any kind of investment. Most of the middle class people start to, to, to live far away from the city center. So you get, you get a kind of a donut, a hollowed out city. Mexico City, it's a very strong place, has a lot of uh, input now, but there are a lot of different social difference. Mexico City is built on a former lake, it's in a valley. And because of that, there is a big problems with, uh, with the water system in the city. Uh, the drainage, it's very difficult to get the water out of the city uh, because there's a lot of uh, paving, not so much green. The first time we, we, we were in, in Mexico City, um, we, had, uh, we had a visit in, in Doctores. Um, we had uh, a few conversations with, uh, with different departments from, from CEDUVI, the planning department of the city. We arrived here expecting that we would get a huge amount of information, but we didn't get so many details. So when we were back in Holland, we, we were still hungry to get more specific information. The first things we did was uh, we started uh, sketching. We started, we took our sketch paper from the Netherlands and we started sketching and we put it all on the wall. This Dutch way of sketching together in a workshop kind of way, that is really something that they find really interesting in Mexico City. This kind of, those kinds of developments will, uh, will raise the prices yeah. and will make the gap bigger. On the other hand, it's a very positive development. Eh? because you, you see that uh, there's more housing added, more commerce, there's a development in the plint. This is also quite nice to keep this kind of uh, building, so you should also not throw away the total identity of the, the neighborhood. Meetings with all kinds of stakeholders followed. Government agencies, but also investment bankers, real estate developers, NGOs, and of course, the people that work and live in Doctores. These kind of neighborhoods neighborhood needs to be asked and to get into this dialogue so they can feel part of, of their own neighborhood. The transformation is not in the in the in the streets or in the buildings 
I don't think there is a transformation. The transformation is in the, in the person, in the people. Armed with all this information, the team made changes to its initial plan and presented it to the department heads of the Mexico City Municipality. Once the plans are embraced, the team will be able to continue and, most important, schemes for funding and implementation can be developed. The result of this particular meeting is that the team will develop a handbook, advice on how to approach doctores, including detailed plans for three pilot projects within the area. Because it's the UN, uh, that gives optimism, because they know they can pull on the UN, they know that they can use the UN to, to push boundaries a little bit further than they can by themselves. Very good comments, I think, and that's, yeah, it, it would be nice to stay here longer, to start working with the different departments. And hopefully we can get some energy, time, money for the Urban Lab 2.0 and really start help them to work on this pilot project. I'm really optimistic about the future of this program and this project, which is very important, that discussion. But the most important thing right now for us in Mexico City is put it on the ground. So the case of Myanmar is very specific. The country is opening up. There is a lot of dynamics and at the same time the government wants to develop in their own speed and with their own ideas. It is just not about urbanizing the country, it is finding the right balance between urban services and the agricultural and rural potential. The government of Myanmar is planning six new towns or urban extensions around the country. UN Habitat has been working here for many years. Recently, the work has focused on the development of urban planning guidelines. The Urban Labs design team took these guidelines and applied them to the city of Yangon. Yangon is urbanizing rapidly, and the challenge lies in extending it sustainably. The infrastructure do not meet the demands, and um, it is very difficult, it's a challenge now to bring in new infrastructure in the, in the current city. The question is, is how to expand the city. It's not so easy because the city is laying in a very, very flood risk area. So there are challenges in water management, but there's also challenges of how to connect this new area to the current city and how to provide public transport and services. Agriculture plays an essential cultural role in Myanmar. Farming is much more than an economic asset. It's of fundamental psychological value. And yet, migration to urban centers continues. So it's crucial that the link between the countryside and the city be maintained. When the design team first visited Myanmar, the group spent much of its time meeting with stakeholders and planning agencies. In the meantime, the team has devised an initial plan, which it now presented is the street, the street section. Because many streets, as we've seen in the workshop, are still developed as rural streets. An extension plan for Yangon is on the table now. But reaching an agreement about these plans and their implementation demands further discussion, as well as commitment and funding. Why do you want to have an extension just next to the capital city? We are afraid, we don't make it quite clear to say the city ends social, social here, media. here, that, that it, it will grow, kind of grow together. And it needs a bit more time to position the plan, to find the next steps. Uh, this is also something uh, to learn from in these urban labs. In this very fluid new situation, it takes just longer to position things. Ghana was the first African country to gain independence from a European colonial power. It's a stable country and could be a role model for sustainable urbanization in Africa. 
The capital, Accra, is a city of about 2.6 million inhabitants, and estimates put the population in 2026 at nearly 4 million. To absorb this growth, plans are being developed to build a satellite city outside Accra. Ningo Prom Prom is about 35 kilometers away on the coastal road to the east near the newly planned International Airport. The location on the Atlantic coast is ideal for an urban extension. The one thing I was very intrigued about um, that we actually plan this huge urban extension that will start with 250,000 inhabitants, but that possibly grows to one and a half million people. We're interested in doing a simple plan, but not a simplistic plan. Having something simple is something you know everybody and people even in 50 years time still understand. If you go to New York, you understand the grid very, very, it's a very, very simple tool. The grid that we propose, that is actually a collection of a couple of islands within a green blue structure, um, is not a fixed form. So it's not a formal city that has one kind of uh, end image that we want to achieve by, let's say, 2050 or something. The government will sit with a lot of Ghana's own uh, very good uh, planners, architects and everything, and together formulate something that is suitable and ad will address the issue. The design team first visited Accra and Ningo Prom Prom in February of 2016. They were then able to develop an initial plan in the form of a map containing the plans and proposed solutions. This map has become a talking piece during the team's presentations. So the next stage is to show this plan to or discuss the plan with the chiefs and people of Ningo Prom Prom. Before presenting the plan to the office of the President of Ghana, it needs to be supported by the people of Ningo Prom Prom and their representatives, the various chiefs. This consultancy is reciprocal, listening to the needs and the wishes of the people and explaining the possibilities the team is proposing. We are in Prom Prom now. We are here to meet the Chief Executive of the Prom Ningo Prom Prom District Assembly. The project actually is up with the District Assembly. and uh, We have to make sure that it is uh, concretely owned by the Assembly. Uh, to the point that it's also socially owned, the people understand it very well and critically. The main thing is that this plan is totally framed by um, a sustainable water solution, mm -hmm. so it makes it, 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 it produces enough capacity to get uh, all the water out of urban systems to prevent any form of flooding. I'm very impressed about what I've seen, and this is definitely going to change the landscape. One of the key issues to success is how to manage land and land ownership. If plans like these are to be developed, the first concern has to be the quality of the plan itself. But support on the ground is also extremely important. So in addition to the many one-on-one -on -one meetings, a plenary session was organized where people could speak their minds. We are, uh, we are here to present the plan, and that is not the final plan. Eh? This is the start of a process of thinking about implementation, how to do it. After obtaining consent from the people of Ningo Pram Pram, the chiefs and the MP, the plans can be presented to the chief of staff of the government. He can then put them on the agenda of the National Assembly. The Urban Labs project in Ghana has been extremely successful. The plans for Ningo Prom Prom have been approved by the local district committee and are now part of the country's national development plan, budgeted in the national budget. The next step is setting up a technical service center to create technical knowledge and to ensure that the plan can be worked out in detail and that it is actually implemented. This will also facilitate continued dialogue between chiefs, landowners and all other stakeholders. The center will be an international location where the Urban Labs design team can continue working with its local counterparts.
this is what we always had in mind with the urban labs, that you have a seed, which is the, the lab that we're doing right now, and that that can grow in a continuous um, exploration and exchange of ideas in order to develop the project. I want to use that. So now we do five labs with the urban labs funded by the creative industries, but you need a thousand if you want seriously want to address uh, uh, urbanization challenges. You need thousand, two thousand labs. Thank you.